Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Okara Vizvi. In this segment, we're going to discuss the UN's highest court, the International Court of Justice, which has ruled that it does have jurisdiction over a case that Iran has brought against the United States. Now, this case was brought against the U.S. during the tenure of Donald Trump, especially, of course, when he walked away from the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA. Iran saying that uh, the reimposition of sanctions by the U.S. went against a 1955 Treaty of Amity or friendship between the two nations. Now, the U.S. walked away from that treaty as well under Donald Trump. Nevertheless, the court said it does have jurisdiction over this case because of that very treaty that had been signed even before the Islamic Revolution took place in Iran. Let's discuss that a bit further. And I'm joined by Yusuf Azizi, who is a research analyst in U.S. foreign policy decision making, and he's also a PhD candidate in public administration at Virginia Tech. He's joining us this morning from Arlington, Virginia. Yusuf, good morning and thank you for joining us. Um, what do you make of the ICJ ruling? Um, it is is it a significant win, do you think, for Iran? Hello, and thank you for inviting me. So, yeah, it is, uh, I can say, that symbolic victory. It is a legal victory for Iran, as Iran had uh, in previous years during the Trump administration, the national institution. Um, it, it, it is a sign that uh, Iran always on the right side of the uh, legal issues in uh, nuclear activity and nuclear disputes between uh, Western countries and uh, Iran during the, the past uh, years. But on the other hand, as I said, it is just a symbolic issue. So uh, a final decision is likely to take several years. And also, there is no enforcement uh, to, you know, um, force the final decision on the United States or other countries. So uh, it is good for uh, the, the future negotiation between Iran and the United States or other parties in the JCPOA. But it's not something very significant that practically could uh, change any economic or other situation uh, for Iran. So then, Yusuf, if we're completely honest, Iran doesn't have that many options, does it, at this point? I mean, uh, what options does it have, for example, if the Biden administration tells it, OK, we want to renegotiate the deal? I mean, does Iran have a plan B? Uh, as you said, uh, I, I think that the uh, Biden administration doesn't have any urgency, doesn't see any urgency to come back to the JCPOA. Uh, they, they might be want to, you know, use the leverage, use what the uh, Trump administration did against Iran in the past four years as a leverage to, you know, uh, renegotiate it or go through the JCPOA to JCPOA plus and include other issues like regional security to the uh, to the new negotiation, but. Uh, you know that uh, also Iranian parliament uh, in recently passed a law that um, suspends some of the uh, United Nations IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, inspection about Iran nuclear activity and also enforce the government, the administration, Rouhani administration, to uh, improve and boost the uh, nuclear activity, the uranium enrichment, to, you know, uh, regain and uh, revolve, uh, uh, revolve the uh, revive the uh, Fordo uh, facility to do the enrichment. So I mean that uh, Iranian wants to show that uh, if uh, United States and Biden administration quickly, if they don't quickly return to the original JCPOA, so uh, Iranian also would return to the nuclear, the level of nuclear activity beyond the 2015-2013 uh, uh, when the uh, negotiation started in the previous in Obama administration. So Iranian has some cards in their hand, a strategy mm -hmm. cards. But uh, as you said, um, there is a negotiation between two countries. So um, each country wants the other side to mm -hmm. um, move the first step. Uh, but um, Iranian recently, the Jawad Zarif, the Prime Minister of Iran, uh, asked the European Union to, you know. Um, come inside and, you know, do some uh, work here that uh, maybe they could plan for a step-by-step -step, uh, plan to back to the full compliance by, by both countries. We're also now joined by Dr. Fahang Janpur, who is a former professor and dean of the University of Isfahan. He's also a former research, senior research scholar at Harvard. He's taught at Cambridge and Oxford universities. He was also editor for Middle East and North Africa at BBC Monitoring from 1979 to 2001. He's joining us today from Caversham in the UK. Farhang, as always, we appreciate your joining us. What do you make of the ICJ ruling that it has jurisdiction, Farhang? How much of a real-world effect can its ruling even have? I mean, it's not really a binding ruling, even if it were to rule in favor of Iran, right? 
thank you very much for having me. Uh, first of all, I'm a former editor for Middle East North Africa. I retired many years ago. So I speak completely for myself and not represent any organization. Um, as you know, yesterday, President Biden gave uh, his first major uh, foreign policy speech, which was in many ways very welcome. He said that America was back. The question remains which America was back. He explained it that we must start with diplomacy rooted in America's most cherished democratic values, defending freedom, championing opportunity, upholding universal rights, respecting the rule of law, and treating every person with dignity. I think this is a welcome return uh, to the rule of law, because sometimes people refer to a rules-based uh, international order. Uh, that depends whose rules you are talking about. But the rule of law is what it should be, returning to the UN and International Human Rights Charter and living by those agreements. Mm. The International Court of Justice, which is the Supreme International Court, has, in fact, already in the past, in 2018, after Trump withdrew the United States from the JCPOA, ruled that the United States had to lift all the sanctions. America ignored it. Now, if you are going to return to the rule of law, I think the first thing America should do is to lift the illegal sanctions, which in contradiction of Security Council 2231 were imposed on Iran. And then if they wish to talk to Iran on other issues, they are welcome. But Iran cannot renegotiate the deal any time that America violates a previous deal. Okay. Yusuf, I wonder, you know, and there's huge um, internal domestic politics as a context here, right? Because the Rouhani administration is on its way out, you know, fairly soon this year, and there will be new elections. Um, uh, do you think that that will make a huge impact on what may happen next when it comes to any revival of the deal? So from Iranian side, I think uh, Iranian always clear about the rights uh, in international relation um, besides any uh, government or administration uh, will take the office in Iran. So we know that the secret talk uh, between Obama and Iran, uh, it's, um, it's eight years uh, after the second term of Obama, it's right this time in eight years, uh, when, when this is the last months of President Ahmadinejad in Iran. So the secret talk in Oman would happen uh, between the United States and Iran. And at that time, you know, nobody knows who, who would become the next president in Iran. Uh, so uh, we know that, uh, you know, um, the United States always calculate uh, what's happening in Iran, what uh, becomes the next president or next administration. Because as you know, the uh, American always said that uh, the nuclear agreement and nuclear negotiation is just the first step to build an up uh, for other negotiation over the region of security. Uh, so, so they they think that uh, yeah, if uh, we if we have an, an administration in Tehran uh, who are more aligned to you know talk to Western about their regional issues, it is better for United States. But yeah. on the Iranian side, I think. Uh, decision makers always uh, would, would be, you know, right that okay. We need first to see the trust between Iran and United States. If United States can comply with this obligation under JCPOA over time, and we see the benefit of that, okay, we can then go to talk about other issues. Mm. But now, uh, when when you violate everything, when the domestic politics of the United States could affect any international uh, norms, not just Iran, it is about the Paris Agreement, it's about other issues, NATO, European countries. So uh, in, in this situation, talking about other issues is not, uh, is made, is not safe. Farhang, I'll give you the final word before I let both of you go. Um, what do you think happens next, right? Biden's given this speech, um, and many people have lauded it for, for many reasons when it comes to foreign policy, but he has many, many handicaps, right? I mean, he himself is, of course, very supportive of uh, Israel itself. And of course, if Israel says that it doesn't want the deal to occur, uh, it can bring significant amounts of pressure upon the Biden administration in order for that uh, not to happen, right? Well, there is a difference between being a supporter of Israel 
uh, many countries in the West are, and I think probably rightly so, but being totally under the spell of Israeli foreign policy. Israel has its own priorities on foreign policy. The United States, as a great superpower, should have its own. Uh, to try to tie U.S.'s hands because of certain statements from Israel would be very wrong, I think, both for Israel and for the United States. The Arab-Israeli conflict is one which needs to be sorted out, but it should not overshadow everything which America wants to do. Return to the rule of law means that the country which violated an agreement must return to it. It was very irresponsible, I think, of Israeli official who said that if America returns, Israel will attack Iran. This is totally unacceptable according to international law. I think President Biden should really turn a new page and return America to the rule of law because this will be, in that case, will have a strong point against Russia mm. and other countries. But if it is the first one to violate international law and the agreement which it signed, which, as Mr. Azizi said, took many years to sign, yeah. then I think it really cannot expect other countries uh, to return to the rule of law. Very well. There at that, but we sincerely appreciate both Farhang and Yusuf speaking to us from the U.S. and the U.K. respectively, uh, sharing their expertise with us upon the latest of where, you know, U.S.-Iran relations, again, within the context of the JCPOAI, the Iran nuclear deal stand, um, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, ruling in favor of Iran, saying that it does have jurisdiction over the Iranian case that was brought uh, to the court against the Trump uh, decision to walk away from the nuclear deal and then to reimpose harsh sanctions on the country. Uh, on the ground, though, as Yusuf said earlier, uh, there may not be much of a change, even, even if a couple of years down the road or, or more years down the road, the court were to rule in favor of Iran. Its rulings are not binding in any way, shape or form. It cannot actually do anything on the ground uh, to enforce them. Uh, so then this, again, just seems symbolic at this point. Nevertheless, it doesn't mean that Iran doesn't have any uh, weapons in its arsenal, so to speak, uh, figuratively, um, to hold the U.S. to account. As Farhang there mentioned twice, the rule of law is extremely important um, for any good relations between two nations, especially nations which are adversaries in the fashion that the U.S. and Iran are. I'll leave it there for now. I've been Okhara Rizvi. Thanks for watching.